We've heard a lot about cloud computing today. Dave did a brilliant uh, description of what is cloud. Uh, I'm going to summarize that now. Um, cloud computing is instant and it's infinite. Okay, so just bear that in mind. Okay. And the other thing to think about is for pretty much every computing workload, okay, particularly ones which are more server based and need a lot of compute and a lot of data, it is the default. Okay? So Okay, so so up to you here. So so we saw um, <coughs> great side of Beowulf clusters. So when I was doing my PhD, um, I was doing that. I was building Beowulf clusters and we were strapping together PCs. We put together Iridis, which was the UK's first Beowulf cluster run by a central IT department. Okay. And that transformed how we do high performance computing today because when we built the Beowulf clusters and we were using 486 uh, Pentium processors with 10 megabit hubbed Ethernet, so not even a switch, okay, I was really excited when I got a 10 meg switch, um, people laughed at us. Okay, the big vendors, I went to an IOP thing and I gave a talk and the people from one very large vendor, that, that time I'm going to show the slide from their first supercomputer, said clusters will never take off, you're going to need water cooling and you need bespoke processors and all of that stuff. Okay, that company now sells PC clusters, okay. A revolution happened, okay. The revolution that's happening now is cloud. So this is a picture taken from the Flatiron Building 1905 in New York. Okay, in 1905, have a look how people are moving around. 20 years later, this is the same photograph of a single horse. Okay, that's where we are with cloud computing now. We're in the middle of a revolution, it's very exciting. Okay, we need to understand it, and that's why you know it's fantastic that IEA have, have put together this, this day today. And at Microsoft, we have this new mission statement. It's to empower every person and or organization on the planet to achieve more. Okay? Not to do more, because you can do more and achieve nothing. Okay? It's to achieve more. And you have to think about what am I trying to achieve. And with the cloud, we put this book out just a couple of weeks ago and Satya Nadella and Brad Smith um, came to Europe. Uh, and it's a policy piece. And it looks at different case studies across different um, domains, including research and a few of our case studies um, are in here, it's actually an Oxford one, I'm going to show you the video later, um, around what does cloud mean? Okay, and we say it's for a global good, it's to achieve more as citizens on the planet. And as researchers, and particularly people in, in environmental analytics, you know, we're front and centre. And so we're really committed to make sure that the cloud works. And from a research perspective, this is a pretty old slide. This slide we've been using for about five years now. And things have changed, actually. They've changed quite a lot, to be honest. So if you identify on the left-hand side, and I was chatting at lunch <laughs> with folks from Rothamsted, around what the world looks like to the majority of researchers, if you're lucky, you have access to a national supercomputer like Archer. Okay. If you're lucky, you have access to a university cluster, Jasmine, something like that. But lots and lots of researchers don't have access to that, and people like Philip Jasmine are, you know, really changing that. And us at Microsoft and all of us in the cloud are trying to move to a world to not eliminate supercomputers, okay? Because you need supercomputers, you'll see later from the Met Office, you yeah, know, they've got a lovely supercomputer, and we need that. We need exascale supercomputing, okay? But what we want to do is try and democratize access to those types of capabilities, but more importantly, share the data. And that's really where I think, yeah, Jasmine's fantastic because it's making that data available and then having computes that researchers can do it. That really is where we see the cloud coming in and giving access because you don't know if the next Nobel Prize winner will come from Oxford, okay, or comes from a university student in the Outer Hebrides doing distance learning because with the cloud they have the same access to compute and data. And they might, you know, be part of Jasmine, for instance, or they might be using Azure. And so when we think about this concept of infinite compute, you know, we need to think about, okay, where is it? Can I trust it? And one of the things is when you think about using a cloud, you do have to think about these things. A cloud that you can trust. You're literally betting your business on this. Okay? If 
you're a healthcare provider, it's people's lives. And again, at Microsoft, because we do things like Office 365, okay, and Skype, Okay. Even something like Xbox Live. Xbox Live is used by bad people. Okay. And we monitor that and we help law enforcement, for instance. We do a lot of work. We have a big cybersecurity center um, where we monitor um, you know, what's happening on, on networks. And so we understand really well all of these issues. Okay. And so when we talk about cloud, you do have to think about this and you know, think about where your data is. And when you think about your own data centers, you think about, does your data center have ISO 27001 compliance? Okay, what is your personal data information policy at a university data center or research center? Okay. So all of these compliances we do, okay, and Amazon do as well, and, and other folks do as well. Okay. And these are just the European ones. Okay. But there's one that's quite important, which is GovCloud as well, GCloud. Okay. So the cloud is validated for government workloads. And what's interesting, and I added this slide for Phil, is that we really believe in hybrid cloud as well. Okay? You need to have the compute where you need the compute to be or the data to be. But what you want to do is to seamlessly integrate that with the cloud, with federated identity, um, you know, DevOps, virtualization. So it's two-way, and you can always move things backwards and forwards as things demand. Okay. And that's where, you know, for us, that's really, really important. But in a hybrid world, okay, we do also take advantage of hyperscale. And so this is a picture of our cloud, okay, um, and we have a lot of regions. We have 34 regions, actually. You'll see comparisons in the bottom left. So we're big. There are really only three hyperscale cloud providers. We heard earlier from Amazon, Google, as well and ourselves. This costs a lot of money. We just announced our three billion dollar investment just in Europe for data centers. Three billion. Okay. That's the level of investment and Dave showed the data center. What he didn't show is when you take that picture now from the other side, you see a building site that's three times the size of that. How we're expanding. Okay. And we're expanding and putting data centers in individual countries. And the UK is lucky because we just turned on our UK data centers. We have two. We have one in London and one in um, Cardiff. Okay. And these data centers give you residency. So it means that you can guarantee that the data won't leave England. You can guarantee the data won't leave the UK. We can also guarantee it won't leave the European Union. And actually, that's the requirement for most things. Um, but UK is, is particular. Um, and the, one of the reasons we did this was, was the Ministry of Defence. So the Ministry of Defence are moving their email to the cloud. NHS is moving their email to the cloud. Okay. And that shows you the power. And Liam Maxwell is the Chief Technical Advisor for the UK Government. And he's the one who's pushing very hard. This is really transformational because it means in terms of hybrid, you've got your on-premise, you've got your local public cloud residency, and then a, a global cloud. We've gone even further in Germany, where we've deployed data centers in Germany, which is disconnected from the rest of our cloud. We call that a national cloud, and it's actually run by Deutsche Telekom. Our Azure cloud in China is actually run by Via21, because in China, you have to be a Chinese company. Okay, so we have Via21 deploying Azure data centers there. We also have something called Azure Stack, where you can deploy Azure in your own data center with the same APIs. And you know, we saw the picture of, of, of AWS, and we have a very similar picture. This is it. We think about data center infrastructure as, as boxes of stuff. Okay. We get a lot of value with virtualization, with things like containers, with things like object store. We can have essentially infinite storage. Microsoft generates ourselves about two petabytes per day. Okay. And our data centers host all sorts of services. Um, and therefore, you know, that's the sort of scale we talk about when we talk about a global distributed file system. Okay. Um, and we build that and we make that available. And network. this gives you a massive amount of value. This means you can do things like deploy a cluster, as we saw earlier from Amazon. And that gets you so far. But with research and environmental analytics workload, the real value comes at the higher level, the software as a service level, things that Phil was showing. These are the services that allow you to deploy a mobile application back end in 10 minutes 
with a database, a documented REST API. Okay, this allows you to deploy Elasticsearch scalably in about 10 minutes. Okay. These are the things which really give you the value. Okay. And we've heard a lot about infrastructure, um, and so I'm going to cover some of the other pieces as well. We heard a little bit about vendor lock-in, and there's quite a lot of discussion around that. And one of the key things at Microsoft that people don't realize is we really love Linux. Okay. Um, so much so, we run it in our data centers. So we have software-defined networking, and we actually run a Linux software-defined networking stack across our data centers. You can now run Linux on Windows 10 in our Linux subsystem for Windows. Okay. About a third of the VMs on Azure are running Linux. Okay. We support all of the major Linux distributions, and also all of our SDKs are open source on GitHub as well. And we work, for instance, with folks here on OCCI. We work on Docker. We're a major contributor to Kubernetes. Okay, we're part of the open source. We're driving the open source ecosystem. There was a report from GitHub with the number one contributor on GitHub for open source projects. Okay. And we saw how one of the things that cloud gives you, it gives you a sort of menu of options at the infrastructure level for different types of machines. And we have, as Amazon does, as Google does, and Jasmine does, different types of machines. So we have basic machines, A-series, which are super cheap. We've got D-series, which are a bit faster with SSDs. We've got F-series, which are CPU optimized. They've got fast processors, but they've got less RAM, so only two gigs of RAM if you've got something that just needs a lot of, of grunt. We have the G-series, which are the bigger ones for large memory jobs. We've got these, which are brand new, which are the H-series HPC, and I'm going to talk about high-performance computing in a minute. And these are the new Haswell processors um, that we've got for HPC. And then the brand new ones are our GPUs as well, and I'll talk a bit about those. So we try and break it down to families to just help you think about the type of work you're trying to do so you can map. What's interesting, when you do a project or you do a pipeline, you might use different machines for different type parts of the pipeline. If you've got an HPC cluster, you're stuck with one type of machine for every bit of the pipeline. You can optimize and have a large memory machine to do some pre-processing to break up a grid, move to some CPU optimized ones, you might need to do some InfiniBand, and you can do that for different parts until you can really super optimize what you're trying to do. And we have pre-canned VMs, so this, if you look up the Linux or the, the Microsoft Data Science Virtual Machine, you'll see a pre-packaged virtual machine that's got Anaconda Python, it's got deep learning toolkits, it's got R server, all pre-installed, you fire it up, bang, I've got a machine, one of those ones whether you want a lot of memory, a lot of CPU cores or whatever. And so the idea of having these pre-packaged machines, we have something called VM Depot where you can upload your own machine okay, to make available to the community. So this ecosystem uh, idea is, is kind of really powerful. So I'm going to talk a bit about supercomputing in the cloud. We talked about clusters in the cloud. I'm going to just nuance that with supercomputers. There's a slight difference. Dave can tell the difference between a cluster and a supercomputer. Dave? Quite forward to interconnect. Yeah, latency. It's all about latency. So if you want to run a true supercomputing, high performance computing job, you not only need 20 gigabits, 30 gigabits, 40 gigabits of bandwidth. You need latency in the single microseconds. Okay. And Azure is the only cloud that does that. Yes. And we have a high performance computing team that built MPI for Windows. We had to write from the ground up at the operating system level MPI network drivers to do RDMA over InfiniBand. Okay, so we know how to do this and we've done it. So Schlumberger, when they wanted to take their um, 3D reservoir simulation and sell it to customers as a service, it's a tightly coupled MPI high performance computing job. People used to say you can't do that in the cloud. This shows their benchmark on, it's only 512 cores against their local cluster and Azure's outperforming their local cluster. This is a slightly bigger one. Star CCM Plus is one of the market leaders in CFD. I used to be a CFD person. I used to do this race car stuff. Good fun. Uh, and we have a, when I was at Southampton, we had a cluster with a few thousand cores, but you'd never get a thousand cores. Okay. But this is showing you know, great scalability up to um, 100 million cells. Okay, over 80, 85% on real application level performance. And how do we do that? We do that because we've got good hardware. We get bare metal performance. Interesting discussion about whether you need bare metal. Because we can deliver bare metal performance on a virtualized infrastructure, right? 
So because we own the hypervisor, we own the OS, we can super optimize up and down, okay? Um, and so we've got this, and this is Namby, which is a chemistry code, and we, we do 90% on Limpac. Um, uh, and so you can see how this high performance computing is really, really powerful. Because what it means is you can spin up a true HPC cluster without investing in your own infrastructure. Okay. And what's interesting is that these GPUs are pretty cool. Uh, and the Tesla K80s are, are, are sort of current sort of production generation of GPUs. They allow you to do things like deep learning. So CNTK is our deep learning toolkit. You might have heard of things like TensorFlow and Cathode and Torch. Um, CNTK holds two world records. One of them is it holds the record for image recognition. So ImageNet is the global benchmark, and we just um, published on ImageNet that we beat out various search engine companies on that. And then, very importantly, if you look up this week, you'll see in the news, the other thing is we achieved parity with human speech recognition. An error rate of 5.9% on the global switchboard benchmark for speech recognition. Okay. And that's using our open source deep learning toolkit running on top of our GPUs. And uh, there were some discussions about GPUs, so I included this slide. So GPU is not just for compute, but this is for remote desktop workstations. Okay, with the M60 NVIDIA high-end workstation visualization cards. And you can do full-speed OpenGL apps over the network down to your desktop. Okay. The other thing with this, which is quite interesting, is that some, a lot of providers will charge you by the hour. Um, the, the, we go down to a file, or they might charge you, you know, different ways, just like mobile phone companies. So we charge by the minute. So when you actually look at how you're doing your jobs, you can do it at a minute granularity, which is really kind of interesting. It's kind of interesting when you, you look at this. And then with the GPUs, we go up to 24 cores with quad K80 GPUs. Okay. Now, this is a reasonably expensive machine to buy. These cards go out of date <laughs> reasonably fast. So it means, again, you can spin these up, pay per minute to do some stuff, spin them down, mix them up with other bits of it. And to deploy these things as well, there are different ways of deploying it. We've seen some script methods. We have similar scripting methods. We have something called resource templates. So you publish these templates. Um, got a laser here, I think. Um, so this is one of our templates for deploying a, a cluster, okay, like we saw earlier um, with the CFM cluster. Um, and you click this button here that says Deploy to Azure. And then what happens is you get taken to this web page where you tell it what the different things are, and you press OK, and it deploys your cluster. OK, so it shows just another way, as you know, we saw earlier, how to deploy a cluster. Now, again, when we talk about infrastructure as a service, OK, we're sort of, we often call it lift and shift, which is how do I take what I'm doing today and move it into the cloud? So with HPC, we think, how do I build a cluster in the cloud, and then I queue jobs up against it, and then I run. And that's not really the idea with the cloud, because with the cloud, it's all infinite. So we've built a system which we call Azure Batch, which allows you to wrap an application, and then from the command line, just fire off the application, tell it how many nodes it needs, and it automatically spins up the job, moves the input data, runs the job, puts the output data where you want it, and shuts everything down for you. So this is software as a service for your application. Okay, and you wrap it, there's a JSON template that you use, and then you can make that available to your users. And so this is a really powerful way, and it's kind of, we call it cloud first thinking. So rather than thinking about what you do today and moving and lifting and shifting it to the cloud, take advantage of some of the things. So most of this is the stuff that you use anyway, and there's a very thin layer that you put on top to cloud enable it. And so this is an example of what we call cloud first thinking. And when we use the cloud, and we were having a discussion earlier, we actually, Simon Handler at Imperial College is doing some NGS work, um, actually on frog uh, genome sequencing. Uh, and he ran a cluster, and Imperial's got a really nice HPC cluster, and he uses that. His department has a thousand core cluster. But he loved the Azure cluster, and he kind of, when he emailed me, this is, um, you know, you said I could you know, show this to people, um, what he liked about it. Right? He's admin. He can do what he wants. It's a sandbox cluster where he's root. He can install whatever he wants, okay, and it's fine because it's fully sandboxed. Um, and then didn't have to queue for anything and could scale it as much as he wants. So that's clusters, and we talked about clusters earlier. It's a bit infrastructurey, okay. 
Um, so I want to move on a bit around data. Uh, sometimes I don't, I don't personally don't particularly like the term big data, so I, I've opted for this alternative title. All things great, and, uh, you know, big and small. Um, and a lot of, well, particularly in environmental science, um, a lot of the data is not big, or it's it's lots of small data. <laughs> right? So again, it depends how you define big data. Um, and so we've got a lot of projects. I've got a few videos. Okay, so I've talked quite a bit, but I have got a few videos. So I hope uh, it's the afternoon TV slot. Um, does anyone recognize this app? Right, this is the eBird app from Cornell Labs, okay, and it's used uh, by Twitchers, Twitchers uh, to go and, you know, um, record where they see different birds. Um, and rather than me tell you about it, the folks from Cornell can tell you about it. Ornithology really taps into our wonder about the fact that birds fly. I love the unpredictability of birds. I love uh, not knowing what I'm going to find every morning when I wake up and go out birding. Birds are wonderful indicators of the environment. So they tell us something about the quality of the environment that can help us to manage it better. You go into the field and then basically you listen to birds, you watch birds, and you record the birds that you see. And the idea was, could we somehow gather this information that somebody in India has, somebody in Brazil has, somebody in Guatemala has, and bring them together into one unified database? And we've done that with eBird. Our goal is to try to provide information for the scientists and for decision makers in conservation. So we practice open science. We use a series of software products that are all open source. Our core for the analysis, Hadoop, to be able to scale that, and we run this in the Linux environment. We now have 325 million records, 10 million records per month. We have gigabytes of data that go into our model. We then generate terabytes of information through the modeling process. To analyze migratory patterns for a species across North America would take us two and a half weeks. We need larger compute resources. We decided to use Microsoft Azure because what Azure had was a combination of cloud computing and open source tools in an environment that was easy for us to port. Azure is not just a Microsoft solution, meaning it doesn't require you to run Windows on everything. Many people don't realize that over 20% of all of our systems out there are open source. Azure really boils down to a large amount of compute capacity that can be accessed globally. And what it does is it says to any organization in the world, you don't need servers in your office. The eBird team has certainly benefited because of cost reduction and time to market. It took them several weeks to get one batch done, and now they can do one batch in just a few hours. It allows us to apply machine learning techniques we're able to actually make almost real-time pieces of information about whether birds are increasing or decreasing, how they're changing throughout the seasons. Thanks to tools like Microsoft Azure, we're able to show bird watchers when there are 300,000 of them working together for a common purpose can fundamentally change how we know the world around us. It's not just about helping birds in a way that we can use the data for bird conservation but how we can leverage that information to help us move towards solutions to these grand global challenges. So that team uses something called Hadoop, which is a, a big data technology. Uh, and this Hadoop just allows you to run parallel jobs in a very nice way, and you can install Hadoop. We did some training in, in Manchester, and there was a chap in the front, and I showed him, we did a tutorial, we basically deployed this in about 20 minutes. And he said, wow, I've been trying to do that for six months here in our universe. So it shows you how quickly you can deploy a standard open source solution. So this is the full standard, actually, Hortonworks had the implementation. But we just take care of all that plumbing and management for you. So it's not bespoke vendor lock-in technology. Um, and with that, you can deploy different things. You can deploy Spark as well. You can deploy R server. You can use a Spark cluster to run parallel R on hundreds of cores. It's very minimal change. Okay. Um, one thing as well, I want to just a bit of a side piece here. This is a piece of technology called Power BI. It's actually a spin out from Excel and it allows you to build data dashboards. The sort of thing you have to employ a web developer to build is basically as hard as plugging in some Excel spreadsheets and drag and dropping the visualization. So do have a look at this. I don't think I've got time to really go through it. 
Um, but it's, it's a, there's a free version of it you can play around. You can load a CSV file or you can point it to a Hadoop cluster and a petabyte of data and you can interactively go and, and play with it. So there's a gallery. This is actually one that shows shark attacks and you can click on a type of shark and it filters. And you can do natural language query as well. You can type a natural language query and get an answer. So for that search problem. Um, this is actually, again, um, the um, Centre for National Statistics in Wales has just deployed on Azure with that Power BI dashboard to make its national statistics available and easy to navigate as well. Um, this is a project, um, so I have to, these are all environmental science examples, uh, called WorldPop. A friend of mine, Andy Tatum, runs this. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to count every person on Earth. Okay, there are about seven and a half billion people on Earth. We need to know where they are. One of the reasons we, we need to know whether these things called the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which are doing things to eliminate poverty, provide water for everyone, ensure that every child is healthy. And so we need to count how many people there are because there's a denominator, what percentage of the population you know, is hitting those goals. And so what they do is they take information from satellites, but different layers of information, household survey data, they even take anonymized mobile phone data, and they layer it together in order to try and fuse it, and they run statistics and machine learning models, and they're at Southampton, and there's a, I think it's an 8,000 core cluster there, and they use the cluster there, but they're using this hybrid model. They'll use the cluster when it's available, but when the cluster's not available, or when they have to hit a deadline, and they haven't got time to wait in a queue, then they can go to the cloud, run the same workflow, but in the cloud. A lot of it is R, actually parallel R workflows, and run it, and they can do things like draw maps of poverty distribution, um, this is across Bangladesh, um, at a very fine-grained scale, sort of kilometre scale. Um, and this is one of the sustainable development goals, um, is um, around gender balance. And this shows the percentage of women who are literate, but on a kilometre by kilometre scale. So when the interventions go in to try and fix this, we can track that over time at a very fine grain. And again, it just allows them to do that on demand. Another great project is called uh, Eyes on the Sky, which is Eyes on the Seas, which is from the satellite application Catapult. And they're tracking illegal fishing around the world using satellite data and telemetry data from fishing vessels. And the cloud is helping them to do that and scale globally. Another fantastic use um, of the cloud. I'm going to try and get some live demos in. So <laughs> I'm going to talk a bit about collaboration. We've heard a lot about Jupyter Notebooks. You can try it now if you're on the Wi Fi because we host. In the same way that Jasmine hosts Jupyter Hub, Microsoft hosts Jupyter Hub for thousands of users for free. So you can go to notebooks.azure.com and you'll get to something like this. And I might. Uh, there it is. There we go. And it's. Oh, hang on, it's my dog demo here. Hang on, that's not that I can't move my web browser. Oh, hang on. Because I've got a touchpad. Uh, okay. Uh, here we go. So this is the website. You log in with a Microsoft account, so an Outlook.com account, Xbox account, Skype account. And then what you do is you... Um, let's see what happens when you get started here. And what it does is it fires up... Um, oh, hang on. I'll go down to one of the intro ones. Um, and so you've got an introduction to Python. You click on that. And then uh, it, I can clone it. Okay, so what it does is it'll take the sample notebook uh, and it will take a copy of it into my own workspace, deploy that on Azure for me, uh, and then I get computation against this as well. So I get, I get a computational um, notebook in here. And you can publish your own notebooks and share them for teaching. Okay, and Cambridge University are about to roll this out for their entire engineering undergraduates um, as well. So, so this is a running Jupyter Notebook, um, I think, I hope. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Should I prove it's working? I know, I'm going to do a more complicated calculation. Hey, there we go. Cloud demo worked. Awesome. Right, okay. So, um, 
So that's that working live, just to prove that it does work. So you can go notebooks.azure.com and use it. So all the stuff that Phil's talking about. And you can upload your own notebook. So you can take an IPython file, upload it, and boom, you've got it and share it. So, uh, and, and one of the things you can do is you can take that, that Spark cluster that I talked about earlier with the HD Insight, and you can drive it from the notebook. Okay, so you can spin up the Spark cluster from a notebook in Azure, or spin up the Spark cluster in Azure to do the data analysis. So how do we use this? So again, at an institutional level, it's quite interesting. In Ireland, they created this thing called the Irish Marine Institute, several universities, and the government funded them to basically try and see how they can make more of the Irish Sea. Um, and they've been using Azure. They wanted to build a, a, a sort of data portal, so they built this portal. But then they said, oh, actually, we need to build this NASA ERDAP portal. So they built an ERDAP NASA portal. And then they had to build um, an environmental information platform. And then this is actually running. Um, interactive R. So this is actually running our shiny server on Azure. So this is an interactive R dashboard. Um, and once they started using it, they went, oh, we could use it for this. We could use it for the R dashboard. We could use it for this. So you, there's kind of a bit of a hump to get using it. But once you get using it and kind of get used to how it works, you can start exploring and do lots of different things. And that's what they found was that you know, it was really, really good for them, particularly around the collaboration. We've heard that a lot today, how the cloud helps to foster and enable um, collaboration. So I've got another, um, actually I'm gonna skip this video just for time. Um, how are we doing? Really cool. Oh, they're all really cool. It's not the Oxford video, so don't worry. Um, so I'm gonna talk about a bit about Internet of Things because this is really, really relevant. So this is an interactive uh, IoT platform. Does anybody know what this is? Um, he does. <laughs> so this is the Met Office's um, Weather Observatories, uh, Citizen Science website. So these are dots, are individual weather stations that people have registered with the Met Office, and the data gets fed in to the system so that the Met Office has all that Citizen Science data to help them provide better forecasts for us. And this is an example uh, in Coventry, I was in Coventry the other week, which just shows that weather station. So they looked at all different cloud providers and they said, actually, Microsoft has this IoT platform, and we have an end-to-end -end IoT platform. How many of you do or have heard of IoT? Okay, so deploying sensors, taking data, those types of things. So we have something called IoT Suite. Again, this is a single-click deployment that does an end-to-end -end system that gathers data through cloud APIs, processes the events, can do real-time stream processing on the data, push it into storage so that you can do things like machine learning, and then, with the Power BI dashboard, you can build a dashboard to view it. So again, it's that higher level that allows you to do that. And again, you can put in open source code of your own, but the, the scaffolding is there to really make it a lot easier for you. And one of the things with IoT is it's not about the devices. It's not about the sensors. Okay? The sensors are dumb on the whole. It's about what happens when you aggregate the data. And when you do that, you often want to do this magic called machine learning. And machine learning is a bit of a dark art but it's starting to become more accessible. Uh, and one of the things we've done is we've built this workbench called the Azure Machine Learning uh, System Studio. And what it does is it allows you to create a pipeline where you pour data into the top. You basically can test different algorithms, and then once you've done that, you can actually turn it into uh, an API. So it looks a bit like this, where you have some data in storage, you have the, the studio, you build models, but typically what you can't do is when you build a model, is you can't make the model available to other people. And that's what the Azure Machine Learning does. You hit a button called Create Web Service, it refactors the model, creates a REST API, and auto-publishes documentation in R and Python so people can then use that API. Okay, and that's the bit that is broken in data science, is how do I make my clever data science algorithm available to the rest of the world? And that's the problem that this one um, solves. I don't think I have time for this demo, Dave, sorry. Did one live demo. Um, I want to finish off a little bit on the application side, talking about the Internet of Water. So we talked about the Internet of Things, okay? Uh, and like I said, we think about data, the collection of data is actually the easy bit. And we do that pretty well. In the UK, particularly with NERC, we're probably one of the best places in the world for collecting data. Okay, yeah, fantastically. The tricky bit is pulling it together into one place and then getting it out to people and then analyzing it and to analyze it has to be in the right formats and that's what uh, Phil was talking about and then reporting it and then maybe using the data for some forecasting so if when you leave today uh, and you go and you 
you go kind of across the park, you end up outside, well, you don't end up, you can find the geography building. And outside the geography building, you'll find this. And it is a hand pump. And the hand pump has been put there um, by a team led by Rob Hope, um, where they're actually using this smart IoT technology in order to eliminate poverty for five million people across Africa and Asia. And so I've got actually um, the folks um, from Oxford are going to tell you a bit about that one. I grew up in rural parts of Kenya, which um, have quite high rates of, of poverty. In our family, we used to get on our bicycles, each of us carrying three jerry cans. So we'll be like three or four people, me, my uncles, and my cousins. We'll travel like 20 kilometers on a bicycle for that day to go look for water. Over four out of five people in the world that don't have access to safe drinking water live in rural areas. This situation is particularly compounded in Africa, where hand pumps and rural water supplies often fail. And one of the newest technologies that's now emerged in terms of mobile solutions and cloud-based computing is allowing us to advance with innovative ways to address this problem. The REACH program is aiming to make 5 million poor people water secure in Africa and Asia. Groundwater is one of the safest supplies of water in rural regions of Kenya. So being able to track the depth of the aquifer is critically important in being able to understand how healthy that water system is. We may be familiar with the idea of using one's smartphone or smart devices to carry around with us and to use to monitor our own health. And the idea here was, well, can't we put some of those mobile health devices into the handle of a pump? So the data is really interesting. Um, when you see a raw accelerometry pot, you kind of get, you get these curves of the actual motion of someone pumping. When the pump is deeper, the, the weight of the water that you're lifting is much larger, and so there will be more vibrations. Whereas when the pump is shallower, you're lifting less water, and so there will be smaller vibrations. Imagine you have multiple intelligent nodes. They're all transmitting data. You have to integrate data in a cloud-based system from data nodes across an entire region, tens of thousands of pumps in our case. That needs to be done in a cloud-based situation where one has a huge amount of computing resource to be able to perform the heavyweight machine learning algorithms on the integrated data. We liked the inclusion of the Azure machine learning framework, which allowed us to port our existing R and Python-based machine learning tools directly into a safe cloud-based system. Azure ML makes fitting machine learning models much faster as I can explore the parameter space much quicker on the cloud than just on my own computer. <laughs> I think making data usable and effective decision makers is absolutely critical. Policy makers and decision makers have the responsibility to take very difficult and onerous decisions and there's, there's a huge information deficit in terms of how they should proceed. So, the ability to collect data at scale in a way that's usable and appropriate for them is extremely powerful. Initially, it used to take more than 30 days to repair a hand pump. But now, because we have this information, when a hand pump breaks down, we can repair them within less than three days or sometimes even 48 hours. So that has enabled the villages to have better access to water. My hope and aspiration is to see this system making my village and other villages back in Kenya water secure and moving them out of poverty. <laughs> you gotta to talk to Robert down. <laughs> That's just with him. So what's really interesting there is that when you take that data and you collect it at scale, it gives you a lot of insight, and that's what I mean about IoT not just being about the sensors. So this is um, some data over a number of um, months. Um, and what you see is that the green is how much the pump's being used, and the top is the rainfall. And what's interesting, and possibly not surprising, is that when it rains, uh, that one there, here, okay, people use the pump less. And you think, okay, fair enough. But what's interesting, what that tells us from a societal perspective, is where are they getting their water from? If it's because they're getting the data off their roofs and collecting it in a safe way, that's fine. 
But if they're going to some pool near the village, which is easy to get to, then that could be dirty water. It could have disease in it. There could be dead animals in it. And that's a serious public health issue. And so by taking the data and aggregating the data, it's giving them extra insight. What they initially did was they wanted to put the sensor on just to know if the pump was working. So from a very simple idea, they said, okay, let's collect that data. Then they said, okay, can we see how often it's used? And then they had the PhD student, Farah, who looked at, can we then measure the depth using the, mach the machine learning model? And then when they aggregate the data, they can do this. What's really interesting, particularly with the depth measurement, is it's allowing them, as they deploy this across the country, it means they're getting a near real-time measurement of the water depth across the whole county, okay, which is probably better than what we have in the UK, just by putting essentially Fitbits on water pumps. And that's the power of the cloud pulling together the data, running the machine learning and giving you that insight. And once you have the data, you can start building models. And what's interesting with this question of water security is you get into this cycle where um, if you've got poor water supply, people get ill. And if people are ill, they can't go to school, they can't get educated, and also they can't go to their jobs. And if they can't do that and they can't work, they can't earn money, which means they're in poverty. And if they're in poverty and they're not paying taxes, there's not enough taxes going into government to improve the water infrastructure. So it's this vicious spiral. So this type of application is really kind of unlocked by using the cloud, by being able to pull all this together to really help with the bigger picture. Uh, and that's the real value. So this diagram here, it actually has things like wealth here. So this is the trajectory for the country with economics, health, and some of the science and climate modeling all pulled together in order to help the policymakers decide where to invest, what sort of economic policies to put in place to help with it. So it's really, really powerful what you can do when you can get the data together and compute against it. And coming a bit closer to home, well, actually, that was Oxford, but <laughs> in terms of the application, this is a project we've been doing at Newcastle um, University which is trying to model um, floods, okay? So doing very high resolution models. This is a map of uh, London, okay? A me one meter resolution, okay? And what they do is they're looking at modeling a 100 year flood event, okay? But they model not just the roads, they model the buildings, they model the roofs, and they also model the underground drainage system. And so what you're seeing here are hot spots, um, or wet spots actually, where when it rains, that's where the water, you know how it is when you drive the road, it's fine, and all of a sudden you have this kind of massive puddle that's a metre deep. That's what this model is doing. Now, at Newcastle they got some pretty good computers, and they were running these models, but they're actually part of a larger project uh, called Ramesses. Um, and so what the cloud enabled them to do was run that model on 570 cities across Europe. And so their website now allows you to pick a city and then play back the simulation data from that, uh, from that city. And again, so the cloud is good for doing the simulation modeling with the reach. Um, for the water side of things, um, the Environment Agency has river gauges uh, on all rivers in the UK. And uh, one of our partners, Shoe Hill, actually built out a map. So I think if you still go to the BBC website, the map with the flood alerts is, is done by Shoot Hill and it's on Azure. And they also um, won an Open Data Award for this, which is called Gauge Map. So this actually shows the individual gauges, okay, live data across the UK. And it shows um, sort of where they are. It tweets, okay, so every stream gauge has a Twitter account, okay, which I'm not quite sure if that names for that is, but anyway. Um, but then people can also upload photos as well and collect the data. And so again, being able to, do you really need the cloud to be able to do this at scale, okay? And the other thing actually with the Environment Agency, when there were some floods a while back, uh, the website crashed because the normal traffic for the Environment Agency is you know, at this level, but when there's a flood, <laughs> you know, um, and so actually they moved the website to Azure to allow that sort of scaling. And again, it's there, we used to call it, I don't know if we still call it the slash dot effect. Um, 
One of the, the other ones is UCAS. So, you know, UCAS. so what's interesting with UCAS is they moved to uh, delivering A-level results online through a website. So what happened on that day in August is at nine o'clock, everybody hit the website and it crashed. So what they did is they moved it to the cloud and they did a really interesting architecture because what they did was they have Amazon on the back end to handle all the data and then they have Azure on the front end to scale out the website. But it really only, it's only for about 15 minutes a year, <laughs> right? But they really don't want that to go wrong. Uh, and so, so this we call it auto scaling. It's quite interesting. You can do this with your project. If your project has a, a website and it has data and you're doing some big thing, it's on the news or BBC or something. What you can do is you can auto scale it. So on the, on the portal, you basically can say, okay, I want to run one really small web server, but I'm willing to have that burst out to 50 web servers if, if there's traffic. And if the traffic on this web server goes above 80% for more than five minutes, spin up another server and spin up another one and spin up another one. And then if it drops below 20%, turn them off again. So you can have a fully responsive dynamic website. Another one was uh, Pottermore, so the Harry Potter interactive website. That's also uh, running on Azure. And another one is EasyJet. So when EasyJet brought in seat allocation, so they used to have not have seat allocation, it's a bit of a rugby scrub. Um, but what they realized was actually that made their system more compute intensive and data intensive. And they realized actually we need to re-architect this. And so they re-architected it so it could do that auto-scaling. So if in the newspapers they say 1p offer for you know, January flights, the website can scale out. Um, so this concept of sort of auto-scaling um, is kind of um, pretty interesting um, from that perspective as well. Um, I've got another video, I've got loads of videos. Um, so <laughs> this is my internet of water video. Um, and it does actually correlate because we are doing some work here with CEH and others around um, some of the things that are in this video around uh, flood response as well. It started the, the night of October 30th. Several miles to the south and to the west of, of the Onion Creek area in the Onion Creek watershed, there was about a 12 to 14 inch rainfall there. And that, that rainfall, that water began to move through the watershed and into Austin. And uh, it really did catch us by surprise. Flooding is the largest natural disaster that people face. It costs more money and it takes more lives than any other form of natural disaster that's faced in the United States or elsewhere. The National Flood Interoperability Experiment um, is designed to develop the next generation of flood forecasting system for the United States that's connecting the National Flood Forecasting System with local emergency response. What we're trying to do is to build up the actionable intelligence that can be created at that time and perhaps even forecast floods before the rain starts to fall. We learned from the NIFI team that when a stream gauge is not working, the emergency response team lose ability to monitor flood. They wanted a model that can predict water flow in river, even if a stream gauge is not working. The goal of the National Interoperability Experiment was to use advanced analytics to save lives. The biggest challenge of the experiment was to bring together large data sets from disparate data sources in order to calculate flood predictions for nearly three million river reaches across the United States, and enabling geographically distributed researchers to collaborate in the cloud. We leveraged several of the higher level services in Cortana's intelligence suite to accomplish this, such as Stream Analytics, Azure Data Factory, and Azure Machine Learning. One of the great things about Azure ML is its ease of use. It enabled us to ingest, clean, and transform these data. It also enabled us to create models, score them, and evaluate their predictive capabilities by simply connecting them together in a drag-and-drop UI. In the end, we were able to generate graphs and show a high level of correlation using the machine learning modules that were available in Cortana's intelligence suite. What we need to be able to do is provide them accurate information that gives them the ability of making a decision on what to be done. Whether to close systems or close roads or close bridges, that type of information is critical to have. Microsoft presented a concept of how to start putting not only 
immediate data but long-term historical data together that could really build out an idea of how to actually manage a flood event in a unique way. Using the knowledge and the science along with the, the boots on the ground, first responder capabilities has a synergistic effect. And so if we can work on, on this experiment and develop a template that, that any agency across the nation could use to, to lay that over their threat and risk analysis for their community and better prepare themselves, we're all much better off. Project. So we did that project about three years ago, just kind of pulling the data together, and then this event happened where the screen gauge failed. And so basically what we're using is using machine learning to infer the data on that failed screen gauge. Okay. And that's what didn't happen the first time. And that's kind of what we built. So I am going to try and show you Azure Machine Learning. Let's see if this works. All right. Uh, there we go. Okay. So this is Azure Machine Learning, or it's Azure Machine Learning Studio. There's loads of help on it, actually. It's quite, it's quite friendly. Um, and there are loads of like video tutorials and stuff. So it's really cool if you like, if you've heard of machine learning, okay, and you're kind of not sure what it really is. Um, we've run some hackathons. We did one at, at UCL uh, where we took lots of data. We did one in Paris, actually, uh, where we worked with the Red Cross. To, they gave us some data sets, and we had a machine learning competition there. Um, so what's cool is you can kind of use it to learn machine learning. Some interesting ones, there's one of the tutorials we have which is predicting flight delays where you correlate weather with flight schedules and you train it on the flight delay historical data and then you can give it a flight next week and it will predict whether that flight's going to be delayed or not. Um, it's a bit of a longer example. It's one we do with one of our hand-on hands -on workshops. Um, oh, hang on. Just going on. Have I lost internet? Classic, isn't it? See, I shouldn't have done it. Have I lost internet? Yeah. Yeah. Is that what it is? Ah, all right, let's go and do the internet. How am I doing for time, Dave? BT time's out. Um, so, the, um, so yeah, so it's a really nice kind of uh, interface when you can see it. Um, uh, I can see my mouse already. There we go, yeah. Uh, Hey, that looks a bit better. Okay, cool. So now, if I, uh, yeah, this is what I want. Yeah, so, so I'll take the tour. This is cool because it's a live demo that's kind of. So what you do is you can go in and you can create, uh, and they're called experiments, okay? And so you have, you can create a bunch of experiments and you can share them. And you can see you have this drag and drop in space. And this is an income prediction model. So from some input data, it will predict whether the person has an income, I think, of above $60,000 or not. And so what you do is you pour data in at the top. So there's a data set in here, which is, a, I think it's just a CSV file that's got um, a few thousand um, results in it. And you load it in and you can, what's cool is you can instantly visualize it. So it takes in the data set and then you can instantly look across all the columns of data and you can visualize, um, so this is going to show you a 50k income. Uh, and then what you do, when you do machine learning, you have to kind of train it, but you have to make sure you save some of the data for testing your model afterwards. Okay, so this is the workflow that if you were learning machine learning, you'd be doing this in our studio or in Python and you'd have to kind of figure it all out. On here, it's super easy. Um, uh, and so you can do that. So you, you have all these little um, boxes on the left, these actions, and you just drag them across. And so here you can split the data and you can set, I'm gonna split 70% of the data and I'm gonna randomly select rows, okay, so there's a random seed. And then what you can do is you can choose an algorithm. Now. We've got some built-in algorithms, okay? So Microsoft has a lot of people doing machine learning because we did the speech recognition, the image recognition. Um, in the lab I work in in Cambridge, where we've got a couple of hundred people, um, a lot of people do machine learning. So we did the machine learning for connect body tracking. We've done machine learning for the HoloLens. Um, if you've not seen that, um, it's pretty cool. I should show a video of that. Um, uh, and we do the recommendation engine for Xbox. We use machine learning to build something called Clutter. How many of you have got Office 365? Yeah, so there's an, a thing called Clutter, it's now called Focused Inbox, that kind of prioritizes email, and that was done in our Cambridge lab. So what we've done is we've taken some of these algorithms, and this two-class boosted decision tree actually is the same class of algorithms that runs inside an Xbox One Connect and inside HoloLens. So it's the same state-of-the-art machine learning. We've made it available through this machine learning so that you can use it for your problem. So, you know, dozens of person years to develop that algorithm. Um, and you can 
pull it in here, and then train the data on that model. Okay. Uh, and so that's what we do that. Um, Okay, and then you can select the data okay, that you want to um, train against, basically. So again, this you would have to do all by hand and you should get all those syntax errors because you've got a semicolon in the wrong place. Um, so it sort of makes it really, really easy. And then what you can do is you can then uh, train the model and then, um, actually we're not doing it. So then when you, after you train the model, you have to score it to see if the model's any good. Okay, so there's another box called score. And again, yes, yeah, so it's a really a data flow graph. Okay. And then you can evaluate the model to see if it's any good. So we've built the model very quickly. Okay. And then what you do is you click run uh, here. And what that does, it spins up the cloud and runs the training. Okay. So none of this, oh, creating a cluster, spinning up a VM, finding the right VM image, whatever. You click the button and it just does it. And it will scale it out onto hundreds of cores if it has to. Okay. And it will just do that in the background. Uh, and that's what it's doing. So it's training the model. And so it it's, just makes it really, really easy. On the left-hand side, there are lots of different classes of machine learning algorithms. So you can compare the performance of different algorithms. Okay. And I talked about the black box algorithms, but there are also modules called execute R script and execute Python. So you can take an arbitrary piece of Python code and put it in. That's what the um, Oxford team did for their smart water pump. They got all these Python and R algorithms that they developed in the lab, and they were able to cut and paste them into here and deploy them as APIs. Um, and actually, the Python has scikit-learn built in. It's based on the Anaconda Python distribution, so everything in Anaconda is in here, and also scikit-learn. We work very closely with Oliver Grizel on the scikit-learn team. And so here what's happened is we've um, basically trained up the model and evaluated it. Okay, so that's cool. So we've built a model. And you can do that. You can do that in R and Python, and there are textbooks that show you how to do that. This is a clever bit. Click a button. And what it will do is it will take that trained model, okay, and it will refactor it. So rather than using that spreadsheet of data, you send it the data through an API. And then at the end of it, it pushes out the result in the API. That's the really magic bit. That's really hard. There's a team actually here, Alex Rogers here, um, and Kate Jones at UCL, who use this to build um, a bird recognition and a bat recognition app where you recorded the sound on your phone and it would send the file up to the cloud and then through an API. So they use this to basically publish their research machine learning model as an API. Um, and that's really, really powerful. Uh, and really hard to do as well. Because what would you have to do? You'd have to kind of figure out how to deploy it, build a web server, do it, secure it, and all of those types of things. And then it will also then, um, yeah, figure out the schema for you. Um, uh, and so it's, it, it's, it's that extra bit that the cloud enables. And it's kind of, we think about hybrid cloud, we think about actually doing the development on your desktop just using, you know, Python or RStudio or whatever. But then the ability to just deploy it like this is the bit that the cloud enables. So really thinking about how the cloud can help you, um, you know, is, is really, really interesting. So um, there we go, there, there creates the output. So we kind of had to refactor it to make sure the data flow is appropriate for a web service. Um, and like I said on the website, there's loads of training material. We run competitions as well. So we run, um, we did one which was a, brain activity competition that was quite good fun so wow so it's great it's a great live demo because it is live right but actually i don't have to do too much of the <laughs> clicking so it's a bit more reliable to be honest um so um is it finished yeah there we go yeah that was that one wasn't it um so i'm going to talk a little bit about kind of the future and how we see the innovation in this cloud space okay and we're talking over lunch about how fast things have changed and phil and i um had a cup of coffee i think it was about 18 months ago when we just started talking we said hey these containers look really cool don't they and now you know he's deployed them on jasmine and it's fantastic so um the speed of innovation is really really amazing and what the thing with the cloud does is when we think about infrastructure and infrastructure as a service it, we often think of it as driving efficiency Okay, and it does that, and it does a fantastic job of describing efficiency. But really, 
what I'm trying to show here is the innovation that it can enable. Because you, you just this, you can take for granted that the infrastructure is available. I can spin it up instantly. I don't have to spend energy um, thinking about this. It means I can spend my energy on the actual innovation, the application, the services. We talked about you know in ecology, you want to be thinking at that level, not at this level. And that's really what the cloud helps you to do. Um, I slipped this slide in because somebody asked about genomics earlier. So, so we also, um, one of the things at Microsoft is we have about um, uh, 1,500 researchers and we have a genomics team who do research. So they do, you know, publish in Nature on genomics and they've actually been heads down um, building a new algorithm. So they've taken BWA and GATK and they've optimized it. So it now goes seven times faster. So it's 700% more efficient than any other implementation. Um, and we just went live with it on my, it runs on Azure, so you can scale it out however you like. And so the innovation that we've brought to the party through Microsoft Research, we can then deploy and make available globally um, through our genomics um, platform here. Uh, and I just put this one because we're talking a bit about innovation. Um, so this is a data center. Okay. Uh, it's called Project Natick. If you look this up on the web, there's a really nice website with videos and things. I showed the map of our data centers. There's a lot of data centers. They're big. What I said is they're big, but we have to build them. We're at a stage now where we're constrained by how fast we can pour concrete. The demand is so great okay, that we're just having to build data centers. Every data center is a unique constru construction, right? Because the, the landscape is different. One of our people in Azure team used to work on submarines. And he said, what if we put a data center inside a submarine? And one of the interesting things that Microsoft now, we have what we call growth mindset, which is basically if somebody comes up with an idea, you can do two things. You can mock them, right? Or you can say, hmm, that's interesting. Tell me more. Let's have a think about that. And so uh, we call that growth mindset. And so we kind of have that now and sort of infused through the whole company. And so basically everyone said, okay, that's interesting. So why would you want to do that? So there's an obvious one, which is free cooling. Okay. And that's great. Um, the other thing is, okay, free power. Okay, tidal power, wave power. More importantly, it turns out that half of the world's population lives within 200 kilometers of a coastline. Okay? And one of the reasons for deploying data centers everywhere is to lower latency and get closer to the end user. Okay? And so that solves that problem. Not only that, it also means you can tap into the fiber optic cable. Right? So you deploy it where the fiber optic cables are coming on there. So all of that was, wow, that's really interesting. The really transformational piece is, this is then a standard item. In the same way that satellites used to be built by hand as individual one-offs. SSTL will know about this. But now, particularly GPS really changed the game. Because with the GPS constellation, it was the first time we had to think about building dozens of satellites that all look the same. So it was a production line. This has the prospect of being a production line for data centers. And the really exciting thing about this is we think this can allow us to deploy a data center within 60 days anywhere in the world. And so it's interesting, just that, that innovation, that thinking. You know, we're spending $3 billion on European data centers today, but we're thinking about how we're going to deploy data centers around the world, you know, time and time again. This is really important as well. So this is... The world's, I'll show you two world records, speech recognition, image recognition, okay. This is the world's best dog recognition AI app, okay. It's called whatdog.net. Um, so have a look at it, it's quite good fun. Uh, this is another live demo. So I, could put, I could put you in this, day. Where's uh, Where is it? Where's what dog? What dog? Oh, that's the one I deleted. Hang on. I have to be a bit careful when I type in what dog. <laughs> dog. Microsoft. This one I accidentally killed when I was moving windows around, right? Here we go. Uh, and I'll explain why I'm showing you this in a minute. So I'm going to put, I did put my name in here before. Right. <laughs> I need a, probably a better, better picture. Which one shall I use this one? Because it might be a high resolution one. Is that you? 
Yeah, right. So what happens is... So this has got state-of-the-art... Seriously, this has got that CMTK deep neural network on the back end, right? So if you load a dog in, it recognises the dog breed, and it's actually pretty good, and we've worked with the Dog Society in America, and they got really excited about it. But we also said, well, not everyone owns a dog. So... <laughs> So, um, is that accurate? Yeah. <laughs> the beer probably throws it. Okay, so have a go. It's good fun. I think there's a phone app as well. But seriously, there's a lot of talk about AI. Okay, you hear a lot about things. And a lot of talk about, um, I mean, IBM Deep Blue when, when IBM beat Kasparov, right? That was a milestone in AI. And chess is a tough game to crack. But fundamentally, you can kind of do a bit of a brute force, a kind of intelligent brute force on it. Um, Go, okay, is a much tougher game. Okay, there are 10 to the 800 permutations, more permutations in Go than there are atoms in the universe. Okay, it's a tough one to crack. Um, the DeepMind team managed to beat the world's best Go player. Um, and again, with Jeopardy, IBM Watson beat Jeopardy at a game show. Um, so AI has this fantastic ability, and we can show that AI is better than humans. Um, Microsoft has a slightly different take on this. We don't believe that AI should be there to beat humans. We believe that AI should be there to help humans, like with the cloud for public good. So the technologies like this, we help humans recognize who they are as dogs. Um, <laughs> but, and, and so what we... <laughs> so exactly, it's good, isn't it? You should try, it's a good... Good fun. Um, so we have in Azure what we call cognitive services. So this is dozens of different APIs, and that what dog is built on the Vision API here, where you can build very complex applications like the dog recognition, but other things as well. We have an emotion API. We have a speech recognition API. We have an API that allows you to actually recognize a person within five seconds of them talking into the microphone, if you've trained it. Okay. So these cognitive APIs are really, really powerful. And again, this is that high-level service, okay? These types of things, that deep neural network, the state of the art, dozens of researchers, real, you know, top researchers in machine learning doing that. Couple of them that are really quite interesting. This one called the Knowledge Exploration Service. We have something called Microsoft Academic, which is, um, it's a bit like Google Scholar. And it's a map of all of the scholarly records since Proceedings of Royal Society. Every author, every paper, every university, every conference that's ever happened. And it's a linked database, basically, that you can search on. We have an API that you can call. But what we've done is we use that as an experimentation platform to build a more generic graph-based cloud system. We call it the Knowledge Exploration Service, where you can upload your own graph of data and then do natural language query over it. Um, uh, and then the other thing is entity linking as well. So again, these are some of the natural language processing type of things that you could build yourself. In the same way with IoT, there are PhD students trying to build that end-to-end -end IoT stack. I know, I've seen some of the papers, right? Or you can go to the portal, click deploy, and 10 minutes have the thing done, and then go and do some environmental science. So in the same way this AI space is really, really exciting, there are these cognitive APIs. And again, another thing that we're doing is building the world's first AI supercomputer. Okay, so we have millions of CPUs. I've shown you about the GPUs. But another thing we've been working on is FPGAs, field programmable data arrays. Okay, and these are really cool. This is programmable silicon. If you write a computer program, you compile it down to an FPGA, and you've got dedicated hardware running your problem. This can be used for different things. This can be used for hardware on the wire encryption. Okay, on Azure, we put these between the network and the processors and the data. Okay, and we've done that on every processor on Azure. So now on Azure, we have got 25 gigabit per second networking across the whole of Azure, okay, which is really cool. But these are reprogrammable. And so we've actually been doing work around AI and machine learning where we said, okay, can we run machine translation on these processors? So we did, we took one piece, okay, it's about, I don't know, 1,500 pages, I think. It took, I think, seven minutes to do the translation on a CPU. And on a GPU, it took, I think, 90 seconds or something, a couple of minutes, okay? And that was cool. It was on an Azure server, and we could turn on the FPGs and it and do it. But we wanted to show the scale of this. And so we cranked up the dial. And what we did is we cranked up the dial to do what I think is the world's first exascale computation. 
So we ran an exa op, so it wasn't floating point, um, computation across these FPGAs, across Azure. Okay, we said, okay, we translated War and Peace, that was really cool. What can we translate? So we, we did is we said, okay, let's translate the whole of Wikipedia on these FPGAs, okay? And so Doug demonstrated this a few weeks ago, and it took that long. Less than a tenth of a second on our dedicated... And again, these FPGAs are available as enhanced networking. But So again, it shows that level of innovation of how we're deploying at scale, hundreds of thousands. This is the world's biggest FPG data point. Intel bought the company Altera that builds FPGAs. And there's a wide article that says, when under NDA, we went and spoke to Intel about this. They went, yeah, we'll sign that check. You know, so, you know, the fact that we were really betting pretty much betting the company. This is our bet against Moore's Law ending, is FPGAs. And we've bet and we've done it. So it shows that level of innovation that we do in the public cloud that you can only do if you're at that scale. Um, and some, I'm just going back a little bit. So this is kind of, in terms of thinking about this, particularly around the machine learning and the AI, is we think about that as a, as a, a, a going from data to action. Okay, I'll show that with a water ladder. And so we have um, ways of ingesting data. So I showed the IoT, but we've got a data factory that allows you to pull data in. Data catalog, which is a sort of database where you can point it to different databases and it'll pull together all the metadata. So you get a unified view of the metadata of all your data catalogs. Um, the event hub. We've got something called Azure Data Lake. Okay. And this is where you can just throw data. Okay. Um, so how many of you use the Bing search engine? <laughs> Bing is a search engine, and, <laughs> um, uh, and there are already two big search engines, there's us and the other one. Um, and, and what a search engine does is it's, it trawls the web, right? So we have the web, okay? And we have to run analysis on that very, very fast. And we had a system called Cosmos to do that, okay? What we did was we were refactoring Cosmos, and we said, okay, let's modernize Cosmos, use the cloud, use Azure. And as part of that, we said, well, why don't we make that available to everyone else? And that's what Azure Data Lake is. Azure Data Lake is that scale of data store of unstructured data. We've got a language called USQL, which sits on top of it. It's a SQL-like language for doing mixed, structured, and unstructured data queries. And also as more traditional SQL data warehouse. And because it's all in Azure, again, the computing data in one place, you can push that into Azure Machine Learning, into Spark, Stream Insight, and then you can push it into some intelligent APIs to do your dog recognition app. Or you can push it into Cortana if you want, or the Power BI system. So it shows how you can string together very quickly this end-to-end -end solution, rather than spending your entire time looking down a microscope at one of these things. Okay? It does depend what you're doing, because if that is your work research, then that's brilliant, because we need people like that to help us. But if you're at the higher level trying to build applications for other things, like tracking illegal fishing, understanding water use in Africa, then this is, is really, really um, powerful. Um, I'm finishing, Dave. Uh, we think about this around these five different real workloads around kind of VMs bigger than your desktop, a bit like what, what uh, Phil was talking about. We think about high performance computing. We think about high throughput as well. We think about if you've got a supercomputer, that's brilliant, but you probably find on your supercomputer a lot of people running single core jobs. And I used to be one of the CFD people who used to get annoyed by them. So actually, they're a brilliant workload to move to the cloud. Okay, it helps everyone. The data science, machine learning, all of that stuff, the internet of things, and this idea of collaboration. So I'm now thinking about those as five different kind of workloads to think about. And there was a little bit about marketplaces. This is the Azure marketplace where you can go in and find stuff. But also, if you're a company, you can sell stuff. So, you know, come and talk to me if you want to put it in here because we can do the billing for you of the VMs plus your application licensing. So if you go in here, uh, you find SAPHANA or you find Oracle. And so we partnered with them to sell Oracle on Azure, build per minute, and there's a per minute license cost. So, so if some of you are now in IEA are companies rather than researchers, um, you know, this is a really powerful way of getting your stuff out there. Um, and this program uh, is called Agile for Research, which is what I do, which is basically working with researchers like David Clifton and like the folks at Texas on exploring how to use the cloud. Um, and we actually have a grants program um, 
uh, and our next deadline's on the on, on the 15th of December. Um, uh, so again, talk to me about that. There's several of those here in Oxford, lots in the UK. We've got about a thousand of these worldwide. Um, and it really just helps people play around and understand the cloud. So that's kind of, um, we've got some cool stickers actually on the desk outside um, as well, if you want those for your, for your laptop. So um, I think that's me done. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kenji. <laughs>